Welcome to ITT Talks. I'm Anastasia Lavrina, and my guest today is Damian Krunevich Meshkovich, who is Director of Policy Research, Analysis, and Publication at the Institute for Development and Diplomacy of Ada University. Damian, hello and welcome to our program. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. We know that you have just came back from the from your very good trip to the United States. You had a very good program there, and I will definitely refer to that. And today, a newly appointed U.S. Senior Advisor for Caucasus Negotiations, Luis Bono, arrived in Azerbaijan. He had very good meetings with the head of the state and with the governmental officials. During his visit to Baku um, and, and these important meetings, definitely one of the key questions is the peace development between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So my first question to you, during your visit to the United States, and this very important visit of newly appointed U.S. senior advisor to Baku. How do you see the position of the United States towards the South Caucasus? Can we already say how the U.S. sees a peace-building process between Armenia and Azerbaijan? You know, it's funny. I, uh, I saw him last week because I, w I spent three days in, in Washington and I spent two days at Princeton University and one of the meetings that I had in Washington was with him. And I asked him more or less the same question you asked me. So the best I can do is to tell you, to give you one quote of his that I'm sure he won't mind. I asked him basically, where do you think this is going and how, you know, are you hopeful? And he said, I'm not hopeful, I'm optimistic. Hmm. And we discussed what that meant, right? But the basic point is being hopeful is... Uh, an emotion. Uh, being optimistic is an assessment based on an understanding of where the process is and where it could go. I'm not sure I agree with him about the optimism, but I came away from this meeting with him uh, very impressed with his level of commitment, his level of understanding, the seriousness with which he takes this issue. Um, he takes America's role as a supporter of the process very, very seriously. And I think that all in all, that's a very good thing. He uh, clearly understands that there are, that it's not a linear process. Um, I think we all understand that. There's the Armenian factor, there's the the Russian and the European factor, the Americans, I think, are trying to genuinely do the right thing for the right reason. And what's interesting is that if you think about it, notwithstanding the fact that the Russians have made various statements and the Europeans have made various statements that seem to suggest that uh, they're at odds on this issue, it's not a fundamental zero-sum geopolitical game. And that's the only theater in the world where you could say that currently about the Russians in the West. And I think that speaks to the, to the fact that each of these three foreign actors, plus some others, who look at this and see that there's an advantage to moving the process forward and maybe even solving it, perhaps not completely, but to some extent, they all see that they can gain some advantage from it. And if you think it through, that advantage doesn't necessarily have to come at the expense of any of the other actors. The two principal actors, but also obviously the foreign ones. And so, you know, maybe the optimism is justified. What are the key changes in the policy of the United States since the time America was a member of the OEC Men's Group? We know about three key actors who tried to help two countries to find the peaceful solution of the problem of the conflict but unfortunately, no any result being achieved. And today we see how the United States of America, France and Russia are trying again to be involved in the processes. What are the key changes in the policy of the United States now? Well, I'm, I understand that France is trying to get involved and I think that there's a lot of resistance, obviously, on the part of Azerbaijan for this and I think there's a justification for that. Uh, but the French role has essentially been uh, substituted and was quite successful for more than a year, by the president of the European Council. Now, the question is whether or not uh, the French and the European, and the president of the European Council, Macron and Michel, 
whether or not these two can work out some way in which Macron understands that he doesn't really have a particularly serious, legitimate place in this process, or at least in the European aspect, in the EU aspect of the peace process. Um, I think everybody understands that there's a power play going on, how this ends up being solved, whether Charles Michel, with some help, with some support, uh, can find a way to make it clear enough to Macron without any consequences in the overall intra-EU relationship, uh, whether he can make it clear to Macron that he really needs to step aside or at least step back, we shall see. But um, with regards to the specific question, America's role, how has it changed? Well, the Minsk group is, is, is dormant or dead. So in that sense, there's no... All of the actors have changed their, not their position, but their posture by virtue of the fact that formally, at least, it's not a sort of outside powers acting in a consensual way towards the two principal actors, right? Uh, but that being said, I think that the United States, if you look at the executive branch, so the presidential administrations and the State Department and the envoys and all that stuff, they have been more or less continuously as neutral as the market can bear, so to speak, as opposed to, say, uh, Congress and the Senate. So I think in that sense, there's continuity, but in a good sense. Another thing, the Americans generally, or at least for the last 10 or 15 years, have consistently been saying, look, we don't have a, we don't have a, 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 a predisposed solution in mind. Right, the last time, remember, the last time that the, that the Minsk group ever had an actual plan that was designed by all of them was a long time ago. I can't remember if anything came up after Madrid. I think Lavrov had a plan later, but basically the last really serious consensual plan was, you know, a long time ago. But now each state, I'm sorry, again has its own plan. Of course. But, well, maybe. But they certainly have different aspects of the process going. But just to come back to the question... Uh, neither then, or not in the recent past, nor now, I think, could you say with any degree of seriousness that the Americans have a, um, a predetermined solution in terms of specific details, clauses, this and that. We want this, you have to accept that, so on and so forth. They do that in other geopolitical theaters, but in this one, they seem to genuinely just want to support a process of facilitation and not necessarily confront the Russians in their, in what they call their mediative role. So all in all, I think that's, it's difficult to imagine a better set of circumstances. So it's, uh, it, it means that you now destroyed one of the key element in the conversation of many experts who are saying that United States are trying to bring the conflict with Russia on the territory of the Armenia, for example, in the South Caucasus, and we may have a new uh, clash of interests in the region of the South Caucasus. But from your answer, I can understand that each state definitely has its own interests, but it somehow may help Azerbaijan and Armenia to move in the right direction. Look, I'm not saying that there's not going to be a serious clash of interests that will affect the peace process. What I'm suggesting now is that uh, I don't see that as the determining factor in the American thinking. And I think it's very important to understand that nuance. And I think that that opens room for both Baku and Yerevan if there's will on both sides, and there certainly seems to be on Baku's side, I'm not sure about the Armenian side, uh, but there seems to then be enough there to maybe move it along. And I think the Americans can be helpful. I think the Europeans can be helpful. I think the Russians can be helpful. But it requires the kind of dexterity and sophistication and balance that both sides, both principal parties to the, uh, to the peace process need to demonstrate continuously. You know, you can say that about Baku. It's slightly more difficult to say that about Yerevan. So let's see. 
That's very interesting. In any case, whether it's United States, France or Russia trying to assist or mediate the process, it's more about Azerbaijan and Armenia who will finally sign a peace deal, if it works definitely for Armenia, because Azerbaijan, since the end of the Second Karabakh War, already proposed to sign a peace deal with uh, Armenia. Unfortunately, there is no concrete answer from Yerevan yet. So uh, that's very interesting for me. Um, how do you evaluate the position of uh, Armenian government, especially when it comes to the situation on the election road? During these uh, meetings, which uh, uh, Louis Bono had in Azerbaijan, definitely the key question is the future of election road. And American representative, he said that it's very important for election road to be used for humanitarian purposes. Azerbaijan support this claim, saying that it was also written in the trilateral statement from November 2020. But humanitarian means it's not weapons, it's not mines, it's not soldiers. It's really when it really works for humanitarian goals and purposes. So what is the answer for this question? Checkpoints on the election road, which was also proposed as an in initiative of Azerbaijani leader? Or you see any other options for this? I, look, you know, I think for something like this, it's very important to make sure that that uh, whether you like it or not, there was a there was you know we've all seen the statements that Lavrov made when he was here a couple of days ago. Um, the Russian peacekeepers are there, and whatever proposals are made by anybody need to be need to have the the operational approval of of um, of Russia at the political level, and then all the way down to the peacekeeping level. Uh, so far, none of the proposals that have been made have gotten to that point. Uh, there are two fundamental actors here. There's Azerbaijan and there's, and there's Russia. There are other actors. Obviously, the Armenians think that they're important, but ultimately, the way, if you look at the way that the clause with regards to the Lachin Corridor was formulated in the tripartite statement of November 2020, um, there's no jurisdictional authority uh, either by, the Ar by, by Armenia or by, the, by the, uh, the, the Armenians in Karabakh, right? So, there's no, so in that sense, formally, it's, a, it's an Azerbaijan-Russia thing. Let's see how that ends up. I think everybody understands that the current state of affairs is um, problematic. What's clear is that the Armenian side is actually actively preventing their own, the people that they claim to represent, from traversing this road. Uh, there have been various quotes by uh, both Armenians and Russians who've, who've made that clear enough. Um, that, of course, doesn't take away from the fact that the the people on the Azerbaijani side who are demonstrating are making legitimate arguments, environmental and others, right? The illegal exploitation of natural resources, all that. But uh, we will see soon enough whether there's some room here to find a creative solution, whether it's checkpoints, whether it's something else. But something needs to give. Now, that should be part of, or should be, it could be part of a broader normalization process on the ground. Because at the end of the day, I think certainly there's goodwill in Azerbaijan or in Baku in official circles to ensure that the ethnic Armenian population that resides in the Russian peacekeeping zone uh, is reintegrated into Azerbaijani society. That's now, why the, the only first way, meeting has been already held yes, last week. Yes, and that was very useful, and it would be very useful for all these sorts of meetings. I'm not sure it was the first meeting, but the latest meeting took place then, and it would be nice if this were to continue. And that's great. And if this moves in that kind of direction, then, you know, presumably sooner or later, this issue will also come up. And the the desires of the local population presumably will be communicated to the Russian peacekeepers. And that could produce the kind of breakthrough that, that, um, that so far hasn't happened. So there are two directions. The first way, it's uh, continued negotiations between Azerbaijani and ethnic Armenians who are living in the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, as we already discussed. 
The second direction, it's a peace process between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But in order to solve the problem on the Lachin road and whether the checkpoints will be established or not, do you think that there should be more trilateral meetings between Moscow, Moscow Baku and Yerevan? Or this is an issue to be discussed between Armenia and Azerbaijan or Azerbaijan and Russia? Well, I can't give you an answer to that question because I'm not privy to the details of the talks. It would be very difficult for me to say with any degree of seriousness, or anybody who's not directly involved in this process, to say with any degree of seriousness what is the best mechanism forward for resolving uh, the Lachin Corridor issue. I really don't know. Um, but I think that the people who are directly involved in this are trying to figure out what the best modality is. And again, as long as there's goodwill, and it seems as though there's, you know, a minimum of goodwill, um, at least a minimum of goodwill, certainly more than the minimum here and perhaps elsewhere, then sooner or later this is going to get resolved. But we need urgent attention to this because of last accident happened again in the... Uh, in the Karabakh, where the Russian peacekeepers are temporarily located, those incidents which happened at the weekend, we have those who were killed, unfortunately, the soldiers. And uh, if we don't solve this issue in the nearest future, if this, it can bring more troubles to the peace process in the region. Yes, it can. And that could, something like this could be a trigger for escalation. On the other hand, you know, it could also be a... Uh, one of these periodic reminders to the Armenians that smuggling weapons in against uh, the, uh, the, 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 the explicit uh, clauses of an agreement that their, their Russian patron is the one who, who guaranteed and, you know, Yerevan signed and Baku signed, uh, maybe they should cool it a little bit. So let's see. If the reports are true, they have enough weapons stockpiled there anyway. So, you know... A couple of more, whatever it was that was in that van, I can't imagine it would make a strategic difference. So it was foolish of them to try to do this. And, you know, they paid for it with their lives. And Azerbaijani soldiers also paid with it for their lives. So it would be nice if this sort of thing wouldn't happen. But the blame for this really is absolutely, without any doubt, to be placed uh, on the Armenian, uh, on the, the Karabakh Armenians, unfortunately. Let's speak also about your other meetings in the United States. I know you had a chance to participate in a very important session to speak with other American experts, with other different institutions. And I guess uh, the issue with uh, transport connectivity in the region, Middle Corridor, the Southern Gas Corridor, this is what the United States of America also want to support and be part in the future. In my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think everybody understands now that one of the unintended consequences of uh, the escalation of the conflict over Ukraine is that the middle corridor is the only game in town. So if you want to, if, you, if you're talking about transportation, connectivity, uh, energy, whatever you want, uh, the only way to move any of that back and forth from east to west is to go through, again, the middle corridor, right? The northern route is the route that used to go through Russia. The Chinese perhaps preferred this route, but the Western-led sanctions regime makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for that to, to happen. Uh, or at least for any goods coming from outside Russia to traverse Russia and then go into the, into, into the European Union. Uh, the southern route is the route that, that goes through Iran, again, Western-led sanctions and some UN sanctions, and therefore that route is unreliable and, and therefore essentially not usable. So the only game in town is the middle corridor. Now, as it happens, Azerbaijan is the indispensable country along the middle corridor because you've got, it's just a question of looking at the map. You have Russia to the north, Iran to the south. If you want to move anything, it's got to go through Azerbaijan. And that has increased Azerbaijan's geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, uh, standing uh, in a way that w would have been very difficult to predict prior to the onset of the escalation of the conflict over Ukraine. And uh, Azerbaijan has been clever and prudent in the way that it has tried to move and try to, 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 to take maximal advantage of this. Some of this takes a lot of time because building infrastructure is not an instant process. 
We've seen already some results. The Memorandum of Understanding that was signed in July uh, 2022, the subsequent Memorandum of Understanding that was essentially um, an extension of the first one that was signed in, in, in Budapest in December, uh, sorry, in Bucharest in December, that involved the electricity cable and green four energy and all that stuff, the four countries, right? Uh, the first MOU was about doubling the capacity of the Southern Gas Corridor, but also green energy, which is why I say it's related to the one in Bucharest. The third element of that was, was, was hydrogen gas and all that. So these are two very good, very concrete examples, and everything that derives from them, of Azerbaijan really capitalizing on, the, um, on this unexpected consequence of this war that's taking place in, in, in Ukraine. So I think in that sense, there's an understanding uh, in Washington and in Brussels and elsewhere that um, it's much more important than it was only a few years ago to engage very constructively and very seriously uh, on an equal basis with Azerbaijan. That's good news for Azerbaijan. Damian, one more question I have to you. I know that these days other university celebrates its uh, 17th anniversary yeah. and this is also the time of your third anniversary in, uh, in Azerbaijan. That means you arrived to our country before the war in 2020, you are here during the war and you are here two more years after the war. So um, tell us more about your life in other university and how do you see the changes in Azerbaijan within the last three years? Yeah, that's interesting. I want to come back to the to what I said before about Azerbaijan becoming having become an indispensable country. And I think I've had this privilege of living here when that has just become a fact. Uh, the indispensable country of Eurasia right now, of the world, but still, it's not bad. Uh, and you know, if you think of this trajectory, right, that Azerbaijan has gone through in the early... Uh, 1990s, in the first couple of years after it regained independence, uh, it was very close to being a failed state. It was a failing state. And I know something about this because my country at the time was also very close to being uh, a failed state and was a failing state and we were, we were also involved in a civil war and all that stuff. Your country means Serbia. Serbia. Uh, but uh, Azerbaijan's trajectory after that uh, has been different from mine, from that of my country. And without talking about Serbia, I just want to emphasize how the transformation has really gotten to that next level since I've been here, I think. Right? There's obviously the pride of having won a clean victory in war. There's, uh, and you can really see that. And uh, it's easy sometimes to forget now because it's been, you know, a couple of years, but you can, it's very present and it's obvious if you know some of these people. That's the first point. The second point, again, has to do with this, this uh, manifestation of indispensability in Eurasia. And that's incredibly important. I think that's going to drive Azerbaijani development for the next couple of generations. And the third thing, of course, is the fact that the people here are incredibly hospitable. Um, every time I go abroad, uh, I've been to Brussels a couple of months ago, I was in Washington and other parts of the United States, as, I, as you said and I said last week, you can really tell this difference between the kind of uh, hospitality and environment and, and just society that's being built here, which is, of course, not perfect, but nothing is perfect. But it's very different from how it looks and from how it is in those other parts of the world that I mentioned, especially when, when I think back to how it was in those parts of the world 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. So it's, it's, a, it's a shift that I think is a manifestation of a greater global shift in, in not just in terms of geopolitics, but just also in, the, in, in sort of this, the way states relate to their to their populations and the role of society and the different and so on. It's a very long, I could speak for a long time about this, but, but I, you know, as notwithstanding all of the obvious limitations and so on, I think that most Azerbaijanis don't really understand how good they have it here in comparison to a lot of other places. 
We hope that once, maybe after several years, you will write a book about your memories of your life in Azerbaijan. That will be very, very good. Damian, thank you. Thank you for joining IDD Talks. We wish you good luck in your work and hope you will find more interesting during your period of staying in Azerbaijan. Interesting things, interesting people, interesting work, everything. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.